God created the world with a purpose, with a desire. And when that desire and purpose are fulfilled, God has joy. In other words, he's not an indifferent creator. He's very much invested in his creation. Which means that when we say to serve God by doing a mitzvah, we mean it quite literally. We are serving God. And to serve him means to do something that is meaningful and important to him. Because if it's not meaningful and important to him, then doing it for him does not constitute a service. You become a nudnik, pest. You keep doing things that he doesn't need and doesn't want from you, and, and you're annoying. That's what it means to not be too religious. Don't become a pest. Make sure you're doing what God needs from you. Otherwise, you're not serving him. You're annoying him. <laughs> so what is it that we can do to serve him? To further the plan for which he created the world, the purpose. So as the world becomes the kind of world he needs it to be, that's serving him. Now, how does the world become the kind of world he needs it to be? Through the mitzvahs. When we perform the mitzvahs, when we put on tefillin, when we light a Shabbos candle, when we refrain from non-kosher food, and we observe the Shabbos and so on, this is serving him because it's making the world his kind of world. Now, how is it that doing a mitzvah makes it his kind of world? If you're honest, if you give charity, you help somebody, or you fast on Yom Kippur, how is it making it his kind of world? In other words, what is a mitzvah? God says, keep, keep these mitzvahs. What is he telling us? Hearing. Every mitzvah is a little aspect of God. Like, for example, the mitzvah of Shabbos. What does it mean to observe Shabbos? Torah says, in six days God created the world, and on the seventh day he rests. So God is asking us to rest on the seventh day like he rests on the seventh day. What does that mean? It means he's asking us to keep Shabbos with him. He is keeping Shabbos because he rests on every seventh day, not, not just time creation. On every seventh day, God rests from his creation. And he asks us to do it with him. Like a father sitting at, this, at the Shabbos table and, and he, he wants his children to sit with him. So every mitzvah is that way. God loves the mitzvahs. They're essential to him. Now, he wants us to join him in those mitzvahs. So how do we get closer to God and how do we serve him by doing the mitzvah? Well, because the mitzvah is him. He is Shabbos Dik. He is kosher. He is holy. He is charitable. He is kind. He is generous. So when we do those things, we are joining him. We're acting like him, but in the physical. So doing God's doings, doing godly acts, like putting on tefillin. God puts on tefillin. 
only not physical tefillin. When we put on tefillin, and they are physical, we are bringing him, that little piece of him, into the world. So when the physical tefillin can help us get closer to God, then the physical world is serving its purpose for which it was created. So briefly stated, when we do a mitzvah, we are doing what God is doing. Only we're doing it in the physical so that the physical world is acting like God. Now the question that remains, if God had never created the physical world in the first place, wouldn't everything be godly? If there's only him, then everything is godly. So why create the world and then ask the world to join him and merge with him and become united with him when he could have left well enough alone. There was only him in the beginning, nothing else. So everything was the way he wanted it. Why create a world that is not the way he wants it and then have us through the mitzvah, make the world the way it should be. Why create a problem and fix it when you don't have to create the problem? Or to put it in very simple terms, why would God create a world? It's a very good question. Yet we refer to God as the creator, creator of the world. And we think it's a big compliment that he can create such a magnificent universe. But it really isn't. For God to create a world is, for, is like for a king of, of a huge, huge country to do some carpentry. It's totally inappropriate for God to create a physical world. It's degrading in a sense. Because God is eternal, God is infinite, God is all powerful, and he's creating this little world that is not eternal, that's not infinite, and it's not all powerful. So he is lowering himself into being a creator. Why would he do that? So it's not like it's God's nature to create a world. It's not. Very uncharacteristic. So why would he create a world? But there's another question. Whatever answer we're going to come up with, he created the world for this reason, that reason. How can any reason explain the creation when in the beginning, when there was only God, there was no reason? For example, you can't say God created the world because he's... He's kind, and so he does kindness. You can't say that because kindness is one of his creations. Just like God created earth, God also created heaven. In other words, spiritual things also didn't exist and had to be created. God had to create angels. They're not physical, but they are creations. So before creation, angels didn't exist. 
Now, what are angels? There's the angel of kindness, there's the angel of healing, there's the angel of justice. So kindness and healing and justice, these are all creations. So let's try this again. Why did God create the world? But he wanted to be. No, that's not a good answer. God created kindness. Why did he create kindness? In order to be kind? But kindness didn't exist until he created it. In other words, if we understand that in the beginning, there really was nothing. There was nothing. We're not talking about mountains and ocean. Of course, those things didn't exist. But when there was only God, there was nothing. There was no philosophy, there was no kindness, there was no love, there, there was nothing. There was just him. Now, in the act of creation, God produced love and compassion and justice and strength, beauty. All of these things that we are impressed with, they're all part of creation. Unfortunately, we sometimes get the impression that that's him. God is love. That's a very Christian idea. And it borders on idolatry. Because if you say God is love, you're actually worshiping love. And not God. So it's very much like a husband who says, I love everything about my wife. Sound good? He loves everything about his wife. She's good looking, she's smart, she's rich, she's capable, she's funny, she is loving. So what is, he, what is he in love with? He's in love with her looks and her money and her humor and her wisdom. Does he really need her? Is he in love with her or with the goodies? So I asked this husband who says he loves everything about his wife. I said, but imagine that the good looks went away and she doesn't have any money anymore and her humor fades and uh, all the things you love about her disappear. Would you still love her? He says, then there would be nothing left of her. That's a serious problem. If you take away all the things about her, then there is no her. That's very sad. All the things you like about her are details. What about her? And this husband said, but if you take away the details, there's nothing left. So, sadly, he is not married to her. He is married to the many things he likes about her. And the result is, she feels completely alone in the world. Although he really appreciates all those things about her. So technically, it's a good marriage. He enjoys, he compliments her, he thinks highly of her because of all of those things. But she, the person, feels completely neglected and alone in the world. 
This will help us understand God's purpose in creation. God is eternal. God is perfect. God is infinite. God is almighty and all-powerful. What could he possibly gain by creating the world? And anything we can think of can't be the right answer because he's not missing anything. So when he created us, is it because he loves our looks, our wisdom, our love, our devotion? Those are not good answers. He's not lacking love, and he's not lacking wisdom, and he's not lacking devotion. He doesn't need things from us. Why then would he create us? The simple answer, maybe too simple, the simple answer is a perfect being doesn't need anything. But even a perfect being can need someone. Not something, someone. The opposite of the guy who loves everything about his wife. He doesn't need anything from his wife. He just can't be without her. It's about her, not things from her. So really in marriage, we should be perfect before we get married. Don't get married until you're perfect. Not perfect like God. Perfect in the sense that you don't feel any need for things anymore. You have all the things you want in life, but you're alone. There's just you. And that's not good enough. So imagine I am perfect and therefore I need nothing. And I ask this woman to marry me. And she says, why? What do you need? I say, I don't really need anything. But being just me without you doesn't feel right. So what do I need from you? Uh, nothing. What I need is you. You should be part of my life so that I am not the only one. And in order to not be the only one, I need another person who is not me to join me. So imagine that I don't need anything from you. I just need you. And for whatever reason, I don't have you. Would that leave me imperfect? Would that leave me in some way damaged? If I don't need anything, all I want is you, and I don't have you, what am I missing? I'm not missing anything. I'm still perfect. I never needed anything, so I don't miss, I'm not lacking anything but I miss you. I don't have you. You are missing in my life. That helps us understand a little bit what it means that God created the world 
in order to have a dwelling place in the lowest world. Creating angels did not satisfy the need to have someone beside him. Why? Because angels are not someone besides him. They're just angels. In order to not be alone, I need someone other than me. Not my shadow. Not a clone of me. But then there's just more me. To not be alone, there has to be a you. That's why a man marries a woman. A woman marries a man. Definitely not the same. Mars and Venus, you know. And it has to change. It can't be your sister or your brother. Not even a cousin. It's got to be a stranger. Because then you know that there is someone else in your life. And that someone else has their own opinion, has their own need, not you. And that's what makes a real relationship. So in the end, what is God looking for? A relationship. What will he get from that relationship? Nothing. Just the relationship. So that's what it means to have a dwelling place. A dwelling place is not an apartment in which you live alone. A dwelling place is a place to share with someone else. So God says, build me a sanctuary so that I can live with you, not without you. So the sum of the, the, sum of the answer is, God is perfect and needs nothing. But in addition to being also humble, and in his humility, he finds himself being just unsatisfying. He is not enough for himself. But in a relationship with us, he is fulfilled. So he is both perfect and humble. And it turns out, Romantic, because that's what romantic means. Romantic means me for me, just by myself, is meaningless, no matter how perfect I am. And that's why the angels won't do, spiritual things will not do, The only thing that gives God a relationship is a human being with a will of its own. Now, a human being, by his own will, says, I want to be part of God's life. That's the purpose for which God created the world. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program all of it 
just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.